Animal Kingdom. Hi everyone, this is Hester. For your safety, please stay seated with your seatbelt fastened nice and tight while you ride. Be sure to watch your children and please keep your hands, arms, feet, and legs inside your dinosaur. This is Seeker. Listen up. We've got to get in, grab the iguanodon, and get out before that asteroid hits. Let's roll! So, from all of us here to all of you there, thanks for coming and have a wonderful day out there in the animal kingdom. Ladies and gentlemen, direct from a record-breaking two million years at the bottom of the evolutionary ladder, let's hear it for the W Radio. Your information station. Hello, my friend, and welcome to the WW Radio Show, your Walt Disney World information station. I am your host, Lou Mangiello, and this is show number 707. And together, as we have been since 2005, we're going to celebrate the magic of the Disney parks, movies, Marvel, Star Wars, and more. Please be sure to join the community, subscribe to the podcast, and find everything else at www.radio.com. This week, I continue my conversation with former Disney executive Dewan Rivers as he shares stories and lessons from his time in the Disney parks and his true life adventures after Disney. Stay tuned for our Disney trivia question of the week, your voicemails and updates at the end of the show. And if you like what you hear, please share the show and tell a friend. So sit back, relax, and enjoy this week's episode of the WW Radio Show. You know, again, I look at everything that you do as a stepping stone to the next place that you go to. So, and believe me, I could spend all day asking questions about Alani, but your career continues to to span farther and wider and deeper because next you go over to Disneyland Paris, yes. um, where you are the vice president of hotels and business solutions. So my guess, and correct me if I'm wrong, is the park has been open for 20 years mm-hmm. Now they need to potentially improve upon shift strategy in moving forward some of the objectives of the hotels and and services and and the overall Disney product. Exactly. Um, So, yeah, exactly. You're right. I got there on the 20th anniversary. I remember uh, Joe Schott was there, who was my leader at the time. And remember at this time, Disneyland Paris is still a separate company, Uh, although we trued up on a consolidated basis. It's on the French stock exchange. It's held separately. The company is practically owned by multiple banking, uh, banking institutions, um, and other investors, uh, big, big private investors as well. So it was very challenging to do the things that we wanted to do from a company standpoint. And it was rough. And, you know, when I first got there, it was frustrating, I think, for a lot of the local uh, cast members because they still want to do well. They still, after all those years, believe in Disney and they have the Disney spirit. So, you know, we had to be careful because they're like, hey, it's not like we don't know what our problems are. We just don't have the funding. So first of all, listening and not coming in and making up, making a statement like, how is it possible that this is the way it is? Well, listen and understand how things are. But then trying to be creative to figure out ways to change things. So during my tenure there, we did a, uh, you know, a large uh, resort renovation. Um, uh, multiple hotels were either under construction, being planned, or, um, and, and, or being completed. Um, but still, it was on a, on a sort of a shoestring budget. Um, I remember when I was... Because the other thing about working in a place like France is that you you tend to rely on English speaking people because uh, I wasn't fluent in French. And I remember someone pulling me aside and said, "Just remember, Duan, the person who speaks English the best may not be the best person to listen to. So you got to listen to everyone." So learning French was, French was important, um, making sure that when I went to meetings with either cast members or other leaders, if it was going to be in French, I had someone to help translate so I could really, really under, understand what was going on in the, in the minds of folks that were dealing with issues every day. And so just because you have an impenetrable 
a wall of challenges doesn't mean that you can't encourage the cash members because your job is to give hope and encouragement. Mm. And when you're able to do like one or two really cool things, people are like, wow, there's a, there's a possibility that we can do these things. And we had great leaders. So, you know, getting that business underneath the umbrella that we have now is uh, the best thing possible. And if you go there and I've been there a couple of times since I've moved there, the park is beautiful. The growth is amazing. Super. I mean, you just got to take your hat off to the team that's over there. But, uh, yeah, the time I was there was, was, was phenomenal. I in, enjoyed it. Um, business solutions is another fancy word for the convention business. So we ran all the convention business and to see what they were able to pull off and develop and create and create these unbelievable experiences for our guests was, uh, was, was, was pretty, pretty impressive. And again, there's there's this shift in in what deal Disneyland Paris was and and what it became. Um, you know, mutual friends and and you know Dan and Lee Cockrell. Um, Lee tells stories about. He says, yeah, you know, the company was was hemorrhaging a million dollars a day, and I don't know about the overlap in, in any of your of your tenures there, but there is this shift, and now people talk about and refer to Paris so differently than I think it was oh, yeah. in those early days because of the influence that you and, and the Cockrells and so many other people had. Exactly. I mean, I'm glad to be amongst a long chain of people who've spent time there and have influence. Um, um, but at no point did the people working there, the folks that had an opportunity to, uh, to, uh, to, 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 to live there permanently, I guess, uh, give up. Um, I think from, from day one, everyone felt like this is something that can work and we can do it. We just need to continue, um, delivering the Disney spirit, regardless of where we are from a financial standpoint. And you can see that the base of cast members who've really been there since day one in some cases and all the new folks still have that strong Disney spirit. And now they have the, the resources to, uh, to deliver it. But it's fun. I mean, um, during the opening of Disneyland Paris, Lee was actually my boss. He ran food and beverage, and I came over on task force. But after that, our, our, Lee and I passed across here, but not at Disneyland Paris. Now they're already um, already here. And I know we sort of inadvertently, I, I jumped over. You had time in downtown Disney. Um, so you had, again, different than the hotel space, right, in terms of retail and third-party operating participants. But I want to jump forward after Disneyland Paris, you come back home uh, to Disney's Animal Kingdom, right? If I have mm-hmm. my timing correct, uh, where you are vice president of Animal Kingdom. Again, I picture you sort of raising your hand saying, you know, what if we do things after five o'clock? What if we expand the park? You know, because it was people talked about how MGM Studios was the quote unquote half day park. But people forget, too, that that Animal Kingdom closed at five because there are. There was nothing to do. Talk about your time there and some of the initiatives, including but not limited to launching, you know, Pandora World of Avatar mm-hmm. in 2017. 2017. Yeah. So when I arrived, we had the, the plan had already been laid out to create a full day and night experience. And uh, the blueprint was uh, actually drafted up by Michael Cole Glazer. And so back in the day, we recognize that in order to do this, and just, just think about the, the park's population growing, growing, and growing. Magic Kingdom is packed every day, you know, packed. Studios packed. So Animal Kingdom had opportunity for additional guests. But in order to do that, you really needed to create a full experience, which then said we needed a, a nighttime uh, experience to anchor that. And we needed a, uh, an iconic land attraction to also drive that but the, you know the supporting things are also necessary you need more restaurants you need more retail space you need to widen pathways so all that the infrastructure as well as the new products were um were considered in doing this and it was great it was great being able to open up new retail outlets um rivers of light has had you know a dynamic and that's being conservative as far as its lifespan um, on that on that lagoon. But nonetheless, um, being able to create a nighttime experience was part of the whole thing. You needed it, and uh, and we uh, 
that experience came on board, and soon after that, um, Avatar, uh, oh, Pandora, the land of Avatar opened, which really sort of changed the dynamics mm-hmm. of the parks, of, of, uh, and, uh, of the park itself. That is what, uh, and still is probably puts Animal Kingdom on the map as far as its unique attractions. Um, the safari is unique in the sense that no one has anything like that. And that's the neat thing about Animal Kingdom. So you had the safari, you had um, Expedition Everest, and then you you had the uh, uh, Pandora, the World of Avatar. All this super iconic attractions that everybody wanted to experience, and each and every one of those brought out the brand. The brand. But uh, Pandora was and being able to work with Lightstorm and... John Landau and James Cameron and Joe Rohde again on that project was um, was great. You got two super creative people. You got just the power of you know uh, the Avatar brand and then the power of the Disney brand and then you you know Disney's Animal um, Disney's Animal Kingdom was was still the only park where the creator was always around. Mm-hmm. I mean, no other park. Has their creator looking over your, looking over the shoulders to, <laughs> to ensure that the integrity of what was being considered was there. And so dealing with all of, all of those, uh, individual personalities and then, and at the same time trying to make sure that the experience, uh, for our guests when they walk through that door, it's going to be flawless, uh, was, uh, super important as well. Yeah. Cause Animal Kingdom too was this park that was, you know, was this, iterative process of what it was, what it was going to become. You know, they were going to have this fantasy world, beastly kingdom never mm-hmm. came to be. Was that, were you, again, the time overlap, was beastly kingdom part of the conversation that was, that was had already sort of died on the vine? Yeah, that was long time ago. I think beastly kingdom, if I remember, uh, was early days. Yeah. Um, it, it was, I think it was thought of as a, one of the, the lands that would be there. So, you know, by the time Animal Kingdom was, uh, complete as a theme park, that had already been sort of passed along and, and discarded. Yeah. And we'll, uh, we'll get to your real world sort of off the clock experiences and how they overlapped with some of the other attractions at, um, Disney's Animal Kingdom. Um, I know, was it at this time too that you worked? Um, you were an executive at the volunteers program too. Um, it- yeah, actually, actually, I did that a lot when I was working here. It was the YMCA Achievers program in developing Hispanic. And I mentioned because I, I I love the fact that you are so like the company itself. You are concerned with with giving back and yeah. helping others. Yeah. So it was uh, uh, YMCA Black Achievers in developing Hispanic leaders. And um, I was very involved in that because it was a program that was designed to ensure that people in the community out there knew that there were opportunities in the hotel business. Um, when you go into uh, to some of the uh, challenging communities out there and you talk to minorities, black, Hispanic, or, or whatever, um, but specifically those were the two communities we were faced on face we were dealing with back back then when you talk to them about a career at walt disney world they they only knew very limited things they only knew that their their cousin was a housekeeper or their dad was this and so they didn't realize that we had other opportunities here that we have veterinarian jobs we those are awesome opportunities obviously but there are other things other than uh, services role, service roles that we have. And so the idea of going out to the community to say, you can choose a career and do any of those things at a place like Walt Disney World or other companies. It was really about getting in the community because it was just, Disney was a big part of that organization, but there were lots of companies that were highlighting opportunities for, uh, people in, in those communities to let them know that there's a lot to do out here and, uh, and give people hope and opportunities, uh, to do those things. And I love that. And I love the fact that, that you give back. But January 2021 comes and you announce your retirement. I'm sure there was a lot of like sad people on the Disney side to, um, to see you go. Uh, you eventually you move to Paris. You obviously love Paris so much. And I look at this as like a first ballot Hall of Famer. Like a year later, you get your window on 
Main Street uh, for the Academy of Talent, Education, and Training, expire, Inspiring Success for a New Century. The faculty consists of names like Phil Holmes, Trevor Larson, Jim McPhee, and Duan Rivers. I, you know, I was going to ask you about your most proud and rewarding moment. I have to imagine this is, is pretty close to the top, if not. Yeah, 33 years of working with the Walt Disney Company and to have that capstone of a window on Main Street is, was truly um, the proudest moment. It's super, super um, proud that I could have that level of recognition. Um, many of us, all of us work at companies around the world, and in this case, the, the Disney Company. And it's not something you... You know, day one, I never said I want a window on Main Street. I, was, I mean, I didn't know how people got their name on Main Street back in the day. But uh, to be able to walk away and for people to look back and recognize your contributions over that time period and to be with a fraternity of people like Phil, Phil Holmes, 45 years. You know, Jim was over 40 years. Uh, Trevor and uh, uh, and I both, I think Trevor was at 30 as well. And, and so... You know, we grew up with, we grew up together. I mean, we, I, I was on the resort side for a um, great duration of my uh, time at Disney, but I remember reaching out to Phil and saying, Hey, Phil, you know, one day I want to work for, work at a theme park. Let me spend some time with you. And we spent time walking around the Magic Kingdom and just, you know, everyone on that, that group, um, it, you know, it's Disney first. They were huge, huge, uh, um, problem solvers. When we were dealing with some of the the challenges with uh, Flight of Passage, when we opened that, pro- when we opened that attraction, Flight of Passage is great. I don't know if anybody realizes, but you know, when we first opened that attraction, this is before I think the public got to it. But you know, it was designed as the most durable attraction in the world. But when we opened it, it ran 20 minutes, and we had yeah. to let it rest for two hours. But uh, you know, people like Trevor and the engineering team. Endless days and nights we worked in trying to find a solution. And by the time we opened, you know, the, it was totally transparent to the public. They did not know that these challenges were, were going on. But you get people like that. And Jim McPhee, who, um, was, who I worked with, was my boss on the, on the, when I was here on the theme park side. You know, his years and years uh, of experience. Um, and, you know, he's traveled and worked in different operations as well on the theme park side. But it was great. It was great to be able to share that with just such an incredible fraternity of individuals. So I'm not going to ask you the unfair question, you know, the thing you're most proud of. Or, but if you close your eyes and you think back on such an incredible career, is there something, is there a moment, an interaction, uh, whatever it might be, that comes to mind first that puts a smile on your face, maybe gets makes your heart race a little faster, maybe gets you a little choked up inside? God, so many. <laughs> um I I think um, opening day of uh, Alani did it. You know, you're just sitting there and, and it's no longer yours at that point. You realize that, you know, you know, you do all this work and you turn it over to the world. And it's no longer it's no longer you. You know, that's not you. And that's what's not important is really the property. But to see that come to life and to see the, the, the smiles and faces of, of of the, the the people in the community that came there and the, the cash rumors that were there, that was that's one of those uh, tear jerking moments that you you think about. You're like, wow, I can't believe we we did that. I mean, I think I was there two years before we started digging dirt, you know. And then to be there from cash number one to cash number 2022 was uh, was awesome. And then you walk away from it, you know. <laughs> Somebody else says, let me go on to something else. Which I'm sure has to be hard, right? Yeah. Let it, letting something like that, that go. But, you know, time has passed and now you have an opportunity to look back at your time at Disney from a 30,000 foot view, which is something I know you have literally seen <laughs> firsthand. Um, you were at and with the company during a time of tremendous growth. And you said yes to opportunities as they presented itself. And I think you said yes to opportunities that you created for yourself. Um, when you look at the company and, and the, the three decades that you were there, talk to me just again from that, that view of, of consistency and guest experience and guest service and how the company itself 
sort of on a on a large scale, you saw that that iterative pro- iterative process from you know guests and cast. I know, and again, it's a very sort of wide net net that I'm casting. Wow, um, you know the evolution. That, you know, we're celebrating 100 years, and for me to have spent a third of that is it's hard to say. I'm like, just how old am I? Um, but it's great. The company has always evolved and it's continuing to evolve. It's great to be able to look back and see how we've gone in every aspect from you know, five hotels to 20 some uh, hotels from the cash member base is, is continuing to, to grow. Um, little things like I remember when I started the number of guests who complained about uh, dietary restrictions. I think we had like 5,000 a year. Mm-hmm. Now it's something like 30,000 a month of, and it's probably more than that. But the number, the guests have evolved and we have evolved. And we're right now in a stage of evolving. Disney will, the next 10 years will look a whole lot different than the last 10 years. And that's going to be everything from the demographic of the guests, the demographic of the people that work here. Um, I remember my boss talking to me about my hair on my shoulders. I don't even have any hair anymore. And now, you can wear hair on your shoulders. I mean, so I mean, things that were entrenched in our culture are now evolving and will continue to evolve. Um, but it's great from a 30,000 foot level to see where we've come and where we are now. I just smile thinking about where we're going to be in 30 more years. I mean, I, can't, I could not have imagined Disney today when I started 30, it's now 35 years ago. What will it look like? It will be just as transformative 35 years uh, from now, maybe more. But it's great. And I think um, uh, leadership is important. Leadership will always have to be important. And we're going to, uh, the, the company will continue to make sure that's a, a focus. And it's challenging now. I mean, you have the, uh, what people are dealing with now is something we've never, ever dealt with in the, in the history. Uh, cast members have evolved in the way we've, interacted with customers have evolved over time, but the evolution in the last three years or five years, it's tremendous. More than the last, I would say, 50 years and right. the, the most recent five years. So uh, there's a lot that people are contending with, but I still hear awesome stories. I went out to Epcot uh, a couple of days ago with Kartika, the new general manager there. I mean, the new v- vice president there, and she showed me around. It was awesome. You know, we have Four women running the parks. That never have happened. It should have happened probably 20 years ago. But it's just amazing the way you uh, look around and see uh, who's running the place the, uh, and this, uh, the, the tremendous amount of uh, change that is happening now. Yeah, you know, we talk about the evolution, but yet consistency in terms of culture and philosophy. And I, and I think back to you and... You know, I try and teach my kids this all the time about the importance of education, right? And, and I, I believe that never, what we learn is never lost, right? And I think about you and your journey and, and lessons you learn from economics and surgical trauma and the experiences you have there help to sort of shape your career at Disney because it, at the very least, it helped you learn to not just listen, but but hear what people are saying, right? I think it's important, especially in in medicine. Sometimes, sometimes asking when the three o'clock parade is, they're not really asking when the, when the three o'clock parade is. And I think it's important that it's not just to learn, but to teach. So, what do you think is maybe the most valuable lesson you learned from Disney, and maybe who said who gave you that lesson, and maybe the single most important lesson from your time that you would want to, to teach others or impart to others? Oh, that's a, that's a handful <laughs> there, Lou. Uh, you know, as far as what I learned, I think it's, you know, you have to build a very strong culture. And when you build a very strong culture and you bring the public and the folks that are working with you um, it's a whole lot easier to survive really tough times because people all believe in the same thing. And so for me, I think um, 
listening to the uh, people like Aaron Wallace and Meg Croft and who drilled that and to me tremendously like this is who we are this is what you are and we need to make sure that the next next generation is prepared for that so you have to because you know many of us discount who we are uh, self-deprecating to some degree but that new person needs to hear your story and understand why it's important and, and what's your what's your true purpose what's your your true your true north um and uh even lee i remember uh uh it's the general manager of the all-star resort we i was giving him a tour on the on the little pargo and highlighting <laughs> all the changes and uh, i was contemplating leaving disney at the time actually and he's like you know, this, what you do is super important. And it's important that you convey to every single person out there that what they do is important. Don't discount anything. Don't discount the, uh, he, we should always say, if, you know, if I don't show up to work as a VP, no one notices. If the dishwasher doesn't show up, everyone notices. So everyone needs to understand that their role in the show, whether it's that accountant, the dishwasher is critical. Um, if I could leave something, uh, my last words of wisdom to, uh, to the folks out there is, you know, you are now the ones at the rain. Like, I'm gone. I mean, there's a whole new generation of people running this place now. And so don't underestimate the power that you have to continue the importance of what we do each and every day. The Disney brand uh, will only survive the next 100 years if they are the ones that believe that they have the ability to make it and they do it each and every day, sharing a story one cast member at a time to make sure that they are fully bought in, uh, regardless of whether they're working at home cast member or a person who's working in the parks or a person who's you know, splitting their time here. They need to understand that uh, this place is bigger than all of us. This place is a, you know, an American icon you know, institution. And you can't, uh, you can't make a light of that. Uh, even if you want to, even if you don't want to, it's just something that if this is the last, and to some people really believe this is the, their last bastion of a hope. It's where things are still good in the world. And if, and if you take that away, then the downstream consequences are who knows. So it's not just about having fun and, 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 and enjoying all the great things that are here, but it's also, creating a place or very safe place where people can can make those lasting memories and everyone needs to know that it's now in their hands yeah, i'm gone it's, it's their job well and i like what you said that everybody no matter what your role is no matter what company it is you probably have greater impact on others than you might realize um i could and i know we have spend i have a million more questions about your career and work that you've done and but you have since left disney and and you know now you just sit around you pretty much basically do nothing you just watch you just watch netflix all day your post disney career is more fascinating to me like i i didn't when i first met you at podfest i was like he doesn't sort of strike me as the suit and tie type of guy and i think that was a pretty fair <laughs> poker read on you because you have a love of not just active sports but like very extreme sports and activities. Talk to me about planes and jumping out of them and just some of the things that you've done because you, if I didn't think that your Disney career and your professional career was fascinating, what you've done and what you continue to do in your personal life is even more so. Yeah, I, you know, I have a passion for life and a passion for like pushing yourself to the limits, which I always try and, I always try and relate that to work as well. So if, if you can accomplish something you thought was completely impossible, then you can do anything. You can, you can, you can transfer that into your work life as well. But yeah, I remember the first time I, uh, my first mountain, I climbed Kilimanjaro, you know, over 19,000. I mean, who years. doesn't remember their first time? Yeah, you got your first mountain. <laughs> you know, after climbing that first one, I was like, Hey, let's go do the seven summits. So we went out and tried to do the tallest mountains. Um, on the planet, you know, hitting each and every every continent. Wait, because you sort of glossed over the fact that I think I'm just going to go. Nobody just wakes up and says, "You're not going to go climb climb Everest today." How do you get there? What what is the process of you? Were you always an extreme sports enthusiast, or is it just were you looking literally for that next mountain climb? Um, I you know, long time ago, it's a, 
Look, make, try to make a long story short. Growing up in Orlando, I grew up with a with a father who worked at Disney all the time. We never went on vacation, never went on vacation. And I told myself, I'm going to see the world. So initially, I um, didn't know how I was going to do that. You know, trying to figure out how to pay student loans and off my entry level salary was was bad enough. But I was reading a newspaper article, um, and they there was a story about becoming a courier. So I became a courier, which means that. I took documents that represented boxes to unique places around the world. And oftentimes you didn't know where you're going until you got to the airport. So the first one, I went to Miami airport, guy with a purple shirt tapped me on the shoulder. He took me downstairs, gave me a one-way ticket to Quito, Ecuador. I land in Quito. I give her my paperwork, and I'm like, "Wow!" And I got <laughs> you know, this sounds a little suspect in 2023. Suspect, right? <laughs> and people are like, are you sh-? "People are like, what were you carrying?" I was like, "I don't know. I didn't even think about it." To tell you the truth, so that was successful. I did it again. I went to Central America, and then literally for 13 years, even after I became a general manager, I still took the because it was cheap twelve dollars to go to Ecuador, fifteen dollars to go to Thailand. Wow. I mean, it was, and I saw 30 countries that way, 35 countries. But after I did that, I remember saying, well, and I love exercise and sports. So, was, so a friend of mine said, hey, why don't you do, why don't you, are you interested in doing Kilimanjaro with us? I was like, hey, that's in, that's in Tanzania. I've never been. Why not? So we did Kilimanjaro. It was awesome. And then after that, we're like, we can do the seven summits. One's in, one's in Argentina. The other one's in, in, uh, in Russia. There's one in Australia. Um, so uh, yeah, we kept ticking these things off. And I was like, this is, this is awesome. I can see the world this way. So I do that. And then um, I did a, if you ever did the, they call it the vomit comet, but it's zero G flight that takes you through a plane. You can fly through the plane weightlessness. So I did that. And I met a person when I was doing the zero G flight who told me about the um, that told me about the uh, opportunity to um, halo skydive over Mount Everest. So we were the first people in the world to jump out of a plane um, at thirty one thousand feet over the summit of, of uh, Everest and fly down to a um, uh, the highest landing zone in the world. And that was like. Amazing. Halo is high altitude, low opening. Orb. Okay. So yeah, so you jump out and you lo- you open your you open your chute about five hundred feet before, oh, God. before <laughs> you're hitting terminal velocity <laughs> while you're going down. So I mean that was that was fascinating. And then you know fast forward, I started to run, and I'm not a big runner, but I enjoy running. And I said, yeah, you're gonna do the Disney marathon. I go look, I got probably five marathons on me. So if I'm gonna do five marathons, they're gonna be epic marathons. <laughs> So, but other than that, I hadn't, I think I ran a 10K most by that time. And I signed up to do the Antarctic Marathon. So it was a, not only was it a marathon in Antarctica, it was a a back-to-back marathon. So we did a marathon in Punta Arenas. And then the next day we jumped on the plane and did the second marathon. We're supposed to do the second marathon in the Antar- Antarctica, but the weather was really bad. It took us four days. I had four days to recover to do the second marathon. And so that was fascinating. And then from there, it was just like every time I had an opportunity, whether it was swimming with sharks in Fiji, uh, surrounded by, you know, massive tiger sharks and white tips and black tips. So I've always had a, a, a liking to do that. And then uh, um, the year that I retired, I was reading about plane walking. And uh, after World War II, a lot of these biplanes that were used in the war were not being used. So a lot of people, pilots and acrobats, um, made their fortune by doing acrobats on top of planes. And I was like, well, let me do that. So literally, you, uh, you go to about four or five hours worth of training. You get in the biplane. They take you up to about 8,000 feet. The pilot nods at you, so double. You know. So you crawl out of the, the cockpit, you jump on the wing, then you crawl up on top of the plane, you lock yourself in, and then he does these aerobatic rolls and spins and dives and barrel rolls. and It's the most incredible experience. It was just a stunning day. It was unbelievable. Then you, you step down off the top of the plane, then you walk out to the edge of the wing, and you don't strap yourself in for some reason. I don't know why, but... You just hold on for dear life. 
and he starts spinning and barrel rolling again, and then you literally just hold, you're literally holding onto the wing, holding onto the wing. Well, they tell you how to wrap your feet around it. Oh, good. Yeah. And so, well, you had four hours of training, yeah, four so hours yeah, of training, you're, so you're fully oh. safe. <laughs> and uh, then you crawl back in into the plane, and it oh. you know the experience is about a half hour, so it's, it's like it's a long experience. Um, I remember when I crawled on. Uh, when I crawled up on top of the plane, it was, um, I had not, it's the first time I've ever used a locking mechanism like this. I was struggling. It took me like five minutes to lock myself in. I was just thinking, all right, don't start spinning until I'm locked myself in. But did it, and it was just an incredible experience. Um, just got back from Peru. We did a Via Ferrata where you climb 2,000 vertical feet to sleep in a glass capsule that's attached to the side of the wall and then you zip line down and phenomenal bike clout riding you ride from one mountain to another one on a thin cable so, <laughs> you name it I want to do it. Nat Geo if you're listening this is your next superstar like I would watch that I would nervously I would I mean that is fascinating and I know the answer to this question already because when I met you a week or so ago, we were having this conversation. And I said, well, "What, what could possibly be next? You already know what sort of your your ultimate brass ring." Yeah, the ultimate would really do be to take a, a ride into space. So I got to figure out how to get onto one of those those uh, commercial space flights <laughs> now and get up there. So yeah, yeah, that's it. I got a big piggy bank over here. I'm putting <laughs> quarters in on a regular basis. <laughs> I, I am fascinated about every part of your remarkable professional and personal career and journey. It, to say it is inspiring is, is, is an understatement. Um, you're inspiring in terms of what you have done and, and the risks you have taken. Uh, I think your career before, during, and after Disney, as we've been talking, I'm like, how would I sort of summarize, like, and I think the word, if I had to use like one word, like it's jump. Like you, you jumped in, you jumped around, you're, you know, jumping into things with two feet. You're jumping out of planes. Um, <laughs> I, I mean, I think it's sort of the right word. And I think those jumps and those leaps of faith that you took personally and professionally, um, have led to a, a remarkable career and a remarkable life that, that really, I mean it sincerely, Juan, it, it's, it's inspiring, not just from well, a Disney's perspective, but personal. Thank well. you. Thank you. Thank you. It's part of who I am. And I think I'm. A big part of that is working here or have worked at uh, Disney. And, you know, my my philosophy is be bold. Set big, bold goals. Don't hold yourself back. The only – you can do anything. Like the world teaches you that you can't do something. But you can be a guy from Orlando jumping out of a plane and over Mount Everest. You know, why not? Um, who's to say that you can't do it? Who's to say that you – you know, if you run a 5K that you can't do a marathon in Antarctica or North Pole or wherever – so combine those passions, find something that you like, and and push yourself to the limit. Be safe. Um, I mean, everything I do is safe, believe it or not. Uh, but uh, I do like pushing the boundaries. And then when you when you encounter challenges in life, you know that they're just challenges. There's nothing that uh, you know. I'm afraid of frogs. You now that is my kryptonite. I will become immobile. I would just crawl in that corner like in a fetal position if this room had 10 frogs in it but that's the only thing i think every other than that i think i could uh you know there's nothing out there that i don't want to try or will try or look forward to and then encourage other people to do it. i want to push you or anybody else who's like ah, i've always wanted to do this like let's do it i'm gonna take you and we're gonna climb kilimanjaro lou or we're gonna do a 3,000 vertical foot climb and walk across a wire across the- he's looking into my eyes like seriously man i'm gonna make you do one of these things i'm like don't if worry. I can finish a family-sized bag of Doritos, like that's a big <laughs> win for me. So, uh, and yeah, and and I can see that in you. Like you want to inspire others. So, what's next, right? Not just in the extreme sports, but what's next for you? Because I don't imagine you professionally sitting still. Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm very, very, very beginning. Um, looking at doing, you know, how can I get out there and do public speaking and inspire people? Uh, I would love to write a write a write a book one day, um, and and just 
continue to not only pass on the things that I've learned here at Disney, but also my, my fun life, my personal life. And so I got a website, DuanRivers.com. So if you go to DuanRivers.com, eventually, um, once we've, uh, we've, uh, gotten information, we'll make sure we send it to you and keep you updated on sort of the crazy wild things that I'm doing. And hopefully I can get some of you guys out there to do it with me. And where can they connect? I'm sure people are going to want to connect with you on social. Where's the best place to find you? Probably um, on um, Instagram right now. And I'll, I'll send that information to you. I'll link to it in social. It's Duan World Traveler. Duan Rivers, thank you so much for uh, everything that you've done in, in, in making a difference in the lives of the cast members and the guests that you've touched over a remarkable 30-plus year career at Disney. And thank you for taking the time to sit and chat with me today. You bet. You bet, Lewis. This has been fascinating. Thank you. I'm a little nervous he's going to try and get me out of the mountain or, or a plane. <laughs> the plane thing freaked me out. It gave me the heebie-jeebies. It's time for our Disney Trivia Question of the Week, where you can test your knowledge of Walt Disney World's history or see how well you pay attention to the details which you see, hear, remember, or taste. If you think you know the answer or just want to take a guess, you can enter for a chance to win a Disney prize package. And this week's trivia contest is once again brought to you by you and the members of the WW Radio Nation. Because as part of the Nation family, you help bring every episode of the show to life, every live broadcast. They're all thanks to, by, for, with, and about you. And you can find out how you can help the show for as little as a dollar per month and get exclusive rewards every month like scavenger hunts, trivia quests, take part in our group video calls, get access to our private Facebook group, the shirts, stickers, monthly care packages from the parks, early access and discounts to special events, and lots more. I'm so grateful for your friendship and your help and your love and support, and I love being able to give back to you each and every month and in turn help our Dream Team project, which benefits the Make-A-Wish Foundation of America. I want to thank some Lou and longtime members of the Nation family, including Barb Tucker, Randy and Denise Jackson, Tara Warwick, and Mitch Daniels. Thank you so much. Welcome to the family. And if you want to find out how you can help the show, please visit www.radio.com slash support. Now, before we get to this week's question, we're going to go back, review last week's, and select our winner. So last week, I asked you to tell me, on Toy Story Mania, what is the highest animal rank that you can get? Based on your score, it corresponds to a different animal rank like armadillo, gopher, bird, rabbit, beaver, cat. And last week, you had to tell me what is the highest rank you could get. First, thanks to all of you who entered, got this one correct, and knew that the answer was bear. And just for fun, the lowest rank is turtle. And if you end up being more turtle than bear, maybe on a future episode, I'll share some tips and tricks to increase your score on Toy Story Mania. Anyway, I took all the correct entries, randomly selected one. Last week, you were playing for a WWDO pin, mug, and a mystery prize. And last week's winner, randomly selected, is Haley Metters. So, Haley, congratulations. I'll get your prize package out to you right away. If you played last week and didn't win, that's okay, because here's your next chance to enter in this week's Walt Disney World Trivia Challenge. So, I'm not a sweets guy. Really, I'm really not. I'm more of a savory than a sweet guy. But, but where in the world, where in Walt Disney World can you find dad's favorite chocolate peanut butter layered cake? Where can you find dad's favorite chocolate peanut butter layered cake? And while I am a dad and not a sweet guy, I've never actually tried this before. Although I sense a research trip in my future. Where am I going to have to go in order to find Dad's favorite chocolate peanut butter layered cake? You have until Sunday, February 19th at 11.59 p.m. Eastern to go to www.reader.com, click on this week's podcast, use the form there, and once again, you're going to play for one of the new WW Radio pins, a WW Radio mug, and a mystery prize. So good luck and have fun. That's going to do it for this week's show. Thank you so much for taking the time to tune in this and every week. Thanks again to Dewan Rivers for joining me. I hope you enjoyed my conversation with him as much as I did. I'd love to hear your thoughts and feedback, not just about this week's show, but anything you want to talk about in the Disney, Marvel, or Star Wars universe over in the WW Radio Clubhouse. That is our fun, free, friendly, and family-friendly group over on Facebook at www.radio.com slash clubhouse. 
Come be part of the community and conversation. You can also connect with me elsewhere on social. I am at Lou Mangiello on Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, and Twitter. If you have a question you'd like me to answer on an upcoming show, you can email me, lou at www.radio.com or call the voicemail at 407-900-9391. That's 407-900-9391. You can leave a question, a comment, or even just a hello from the parks. And don't forget to look for a new episode of the show in your feed starting Thursday. I mentioned last week I'm going to be adding a second show to the feed. Don't worry. You don't have to do anything or subscribe to anything new. It's going to include shows from the vault, some past evergreen episodes, interviews, reviews, and discussions that maybe you missed. It's also going to include some other shows, including some short solo segments, uh, including like, but not limited to maybe my own top fives, some timely and time sensitive conversations and reviews, maybe some more Marvel or Star Wars. And of course, I'm always open to your suggestions as well. And of course, in addition to the show and connecting with you online, I still believe that nothing beats a handshake and a hug. Check out our events page at www.radio.com and on Facebook. And stay tuned for details about our next Meet of the Month in Walt Disney World. It's going to take place over Princess Marathon weekend. Later this month, I will have a date and time and location coming very soon. To make sure you get notified of that and other things that are happening in and around WW Radio, be sure and subscribe to our free weekly email newsletter just by going to www.radio.com. And if and when you do, you're also going to get a free copy of my 102 Things to Do at Walt Disney World at Least Once book. In addition to everything I do on the Disney side, please go and check out LouMangelo.com to find out how I can work with you. If you have an idea, a business or brand that you want to take to the next level, we can work one-on-one in my weekly mastermind group or by attending my weekend workshop in Walt Disney World this fall or my Momentum Weekend Retreat coming up this April. There are currently only two spots remaining and now until February 25th, you can still take advantage of the $200 off super duper early bird special by visiting lumangelo.com. I'm also a keynote speaker who can come and present to your event, your conference, your business, or your school about everything from customer service lessons we can learn from the Disney parks, leadership lessons we can learn from Walt Disney, pursuing your passion, and they all contain real-world, actionable content and strategies with some Disney lessons and experiences and focus and stories custom-tailored to your industry and audience. Again, to find out more, visit lumangelo.com. Thank you, as always, to Mouse Fan Travel, my official and recommended travel provider. It's who I've used. It's who I recommend because it's who I trust for more than 15, 16, 17 years, a long, long time. And we've been together and I've recommended them for so long because of the service they provide. And they treat you like family and everyone is a VIP. For a free, no obligation quote, you can reach out to mousefantravel.com. And as always, my friend, and you are my friend, whether we have met yet or not, all I ask is that if you like the show, please help spread the word. Tell a friend, share a link to this or your favorite episode. Take a screenshot while you're listening. Share it on social. Tag me at Lou Mangiello. I will reshare it and follow you back. And if you can, take just a couple of seconds to rate and review the show over in Spotify or more importantly, Apple Podcasts, where you can leave a review. I want to thank some recent reviewers like Chloe456, who says the show is like comfort food. I love the introduction segment. We are tuning in a radio into the show. Lou's enthusiasm and positivity shine through. Chloe, thank you very much. And thank you, my friend, for taking the time, which I know is so incredibly valuable, spending and sharing it with me, for being part of this incredible community. And this past week on February 11th, we celebrated 16 years of WDW Radio. That is a testament to you and thanks to you. And my thanks to you for gifting me this incredible life and this incredible extended family as a result of that. You've done so much to make me happy and I hope that the show and the community and everything we do together makes you and your day happier and inspires you to be better and to choose the good. And I hope that this is your best week ever. I hope to see you on Wednesday night at WW Radio Live in the clubhouse and maybe even in the Disney park soon. So until next time, thanks again. Love you. See ya. What's going on, Lou? We're on our last little Skyliner ride back to Pop Century. We're overlooking Hollywood Studios as we speak. And just want to say thanks again for what you do with your show. And uh, we pick up little tips and tricks every time we listen to your podcast. And uh, I need to plan one of my trips around one of your events because I joked with my wife, Laura, that it would be the ultimate to bump into you while we're on this little weekend trip. It's Monday, February 6th. But 
anyway, just wanted to encourage you, man. And um, we feels like we bring a little part of, of the show and you with us every time we come down here. And you plus this experience for us so much. Um, really appreciate you. Really appreciate WDW Radio Nation and um, the work you guys put in. Hi, everyone. It's Elizabeth from Massachusetts. Um, I don't know where the past two months of my life went <laughs> since the holidays, but I have not called in, and I'm a little bit behind on episodes, too. But uh, let's get started. A few things. Lou, everybody, congrats on 700 episodes. Absolutely wild. So much content. So much great work. So much Disney love. Be so proud. Um, just finished uh, listening to the episode about favorite walks. Uh, you hit on some of my absolute favorite and um, I think that's to anyone, like, finding out whichever resort you're at, whichever park you're at, kind of, like, search for those quiet spots and spaces. Um, I think that some of the best Disney moments are in the morning before, you know, the world is awake. It's quiet. It's calm. Find that little path or trail near your resort and just kind of take a nice little walk or run. Um, it's some of my most favorite moments. Most recently stayed at Sea Lake um, with the Contemporary. That running trail there near the uh, uh, Magic Kingdom Loop is, is one of my favorites. So highly suggested if you are going to stay there soon or um, you're there now or whatever, don't not do it. Um, get up early one day and uh, take a little stroll. So, yeah, um, let's see. I actually did something wild um, in December right before the holidays. Me and a friend flew from Boston did all four parks, got into all four parks and did one attraction and flew home the same night. So we did it. We've been dying to do it. She's actually moving out to California. So we wanted to do one more hurrah over here on the East Coast with Walt Disney World before I get to go visit her in Disneyland all the time now. So it was amazing, and I suggest it for everyone to do it one time just to say you did it because it was a ton of fun. Um, so, yeah, that was kind of a fun thing I did. Anyways, um, I'm realizing now it's been two minutes that I've been talking, so I'm going to get going. But, again, just good to call in. I don't know what happened these past few months, but I guess life just gets crazy sometimes. So, yeah, hope everyone's doing well. Stay magical, be magical, and I'll talk to you all real soon. Bye.